Hello everyone, welcome back to day two and panel two of the Uncovered uh, Conference. According to Reporters Without Borders, Europe is the most favorable continent on for press uh, freedom. But of course, uh, there are other countries, other continents, uh, Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, where the situation might not be as favorable and, uh, and uh, well, uh, for uh, press freedom and cross-border journalism in particular. That is going to be the topic of uh, this following panel, Lessons for Europe, Cross-Border Journalism Around the World. And I'm happy to yield the floor to the moderator, the chair of the session. She's the executive director of the International Press Institute, Barbara Trinfi. Barbara, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for this panel to the organizers. So basically, throughout the presentation that we heard yesterday, so we, we, we got an opportunity to um, get a sense of the important investigations that were made possible by the IJ4 EU fund in Europe. And uh, indeed, uh, we also need to consider that the IJ4 EU fund has provided not only the necessary funds to allow journalists to dedicate time and resources to these investigations, but has also offered editorial support, um, different forms of trainings, as well as legal support to those grantees that have um, requested it. And this panel today is going to look at what the benefits are of uh, cross-border journalism around the world and uh, what do we need to have in place in order to ensure that cross-border journalism can flourish. Um, the, we have three great panelists today um, and I kindly ask them to turn on their cameras. Catherine uh, uh, Gifferou, based in Nairobi, Kenya. Carlos Eduardo Huertas, based in Bogota, Colombia, and Carol Ilagan, based in Manila, in the Philippines. Welcome to the panel. While we wait for the panelists to come up, I also would like to encourage all participants to post your questions or comments for the panelists in the chat box. And um, I'll do my best throughout the discussion to turn these questions to our speakers. So let me start with you, Catherine. Catherine Kishiru is the founder of the African Women Journalism Project, which is dedicated to strengthening the voices of women journalists and driving coverage of underreported um, topics, uh, such as gender, health, or development issues. Catherine has also a long experience as an editor in Kenya. You were the first woman to serve as an editor of the Nation Media Group, and uh, you were also founding managing editor at the Star newspaper in Nairobi. Catherine, the African Women Journalism Project uh, has members in five countries, Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, if I'm correct. And they work collaboratively to, on cross-border journalism project. Uh, my question to you is, why did you decide to work cross-border? And, and how is this making a difference in the type of journalism that you're generating? Catherine, I think you're still muted. Uh, it, it just Excellent. makes sense. I mean, it made sense to us to be working to collaboratively because we are facing similar issues, similar challenges in the five countries that we are targeting, we are working in. And the most interesting thing is that we as journalists are supposed to be kind of not only reporting on issues that concern everyone, but especially those ones who are living at the margins. So women, girls, the disabled and others. And I thought, why not try and report on those issues because it also gives us an opportunity to say, for example, we have a problem in uh, in one country and this is the community or the society is addressing that problem. That could be something that can be replicated in a second country. And working together with other journalists from the different countries, it means that then we are able to give 
more information, we are then able to, to kind of widen the knowledge, as it were, that exists in those different communities or societies. At the same time, it also helps us, um, some of the newsrooms, because of the financial troubles we're all going through, may not have the kind of expertise that we have access to or I have access to. So working together means that, or working collaboratively means we are able to share skills and expertise. For example, some of the newsrooms, we were, the fellows we're working with in some of the newsrooms do not have uh, somebody who can actually analyze data. So if they can have somebody who can help them do the data analysis, then it means they don't really need to worry. We are not going to be able to do this story because we don't have this expertise. So there's that as well as it really kind of, this, we, we are no longer living in a small little pigeon hold. These countries of ours, we are living in a global kind of society or economy or whatever you want to call it. And what is happening in one, one part of the world is going to have an impact on your side. So it's important that we actually start telling the human story, not the Filipino story, not the Colombian story, but actually telling the story of the, the human story, the struggles we are going through. And it didn't take the COVID pandemic to make us realize that. I think this is something that post post is we should be the norm, not the abnormality. We should all be trying to work together to tell this story. So that's for me, it was just a given. The story, what is happening in one part of Africa has some significance in another part of Africa or even another part of the world. So obviously let's tell these stories together. Great, great. Thank you, Catherine. That, that is a great um, order. And I'll, I'll come back to you on that, but maybe let me move on to um, Carlos uh, for now. Carlos Eduardo Huertas, um, you're one of Latin America's leading investigative journalists, uh, and you're currently the director of Connectus, uh, as well as the chief of party of the Investigative Reporting Initiative for the Americas, if I'm right. Um, and Connectus is an accelerator platform that has become a reference for investigative journalism in the Americas because of its commitment to journalistic collaboration uh, aimed at the production of in-depth stories. Um, when, in which, you know, Catherine mentioned a number of topics, a number of issues when, for which cross-border um, journalism is relevant. According to your experience, when is cross-border journalism particularly relevant? Uh, um, and, and, and what do these type of cross-border collaboration entails in Latin America? On to you, Carlos. Great. First, uh, many thanks for, for the invitation. I'm so proud to share this panel for with distinguished group with Carol, Catherine, and, and with you, Barbara. Uh, well, that's that's isn't a good question. In, in, in Connectus, believe that the cross-border collaboration is a set of techniques, methodologies, and collective learnings that are applied according to the situation. We see collaboration from a broader perspective. First, the main trigger is solidarity. The second is capacity, and the third one is impact. Today, we have a complex realities that permanently active one or all of them. Uh, not only the realities that are born in the stories, such as transnational phenomena, but also the reality of the journalism uh, and the media, no? as you mentioned uh, when you started the, the, the panel. Uh, they need to improve their knowledge, they need to improve the skills, they need to share the costs. And that was very relevant, for example, in times of the pandemic times, they need to work together to complement information and talent was very evident. Uh, I will share in, in the chat uh, an example about the combination of them in, in examples that, that we are that we are doing in, in Connectus. Let me try to look the chat. 
Okay, I, I put that one example. And um, this is uh, in, in English, in Spanish, and in French, in French too. Uh, well, your question is what do these cross-border collaborations entail? No? And I usually mention the same, no? collaborative work imposes great responsibilities. It is like a body with many extensions. There are issues that compromise the physical security of those who participate. There are situations of digital monitoring and communications. There are laws that they push a legal risks. The contrastive work in many cases is complex. High standards are required and the closing moments are sometimes challenging. You know? The deadlines are sometimes very challenging. Do it well implies being attentive and finding creative and effective solutions. For example, right now in Connectus Hub, that is the name that, uh, that we have for our journalistic community, participating more than 115 journalists in 20 countries. And, and Connectus, as an accelerator, we promote better journalism, help to provide resources, promote ideas for projects, and we participate journalistically to make the stories. Thank you. That that is um, really um, that is really interesting. Um, let me um, move on to um, Carol. Carol um, Ilagan, um, you're a Filipino journalist um, uh, reporting for and managing the editorial desk of the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism, which is a Manila-based investigative nonprofit organization. And Carol, you also lead uh, the, the PCIJ's collaborations with local, regional, and global news um, outlets. Uh, uh, Carlos just mentioned the fact that cross-border collaborations are also relevant in case of uh, whenever there are legal restrictions. So basically operating in restricting countries. So, um, and, and uh, so I was wondering, uh, specifically looking at the Philippines and also all the press freedom hurdles that journalists are facing in the country, what is the specific, specific value that you see for, for, for uh, cross-border journalism in your region? Thank you, Barbara, and um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm happy to be here, and I can't agree more with what Catherine and Carlos have said um, a while ago. Um, in the case for the Philippines, and of course, the many other countries um, operating in liberal democracies or restricted or flawed democracies, I guess um, the context is corruption, crimes, and various forms of injustices continue to happen in plain sight in many countries and specifically in these countries. So within borders and also across borders. But cross-border collaborations, investigative collaborations can provide support for journalists who may not be able to freely do the kind of reporting needed in their own countries. So specifically for countries where you have issues with freedom of expression, freedom of information. But by sharing information, skills, technology, and platform, we can help each other ferret these stories out. Because as Catherine mentioned earlier, what happens in another country is linked or you know has an impact to what happens in another country. So there are ways on how to get information. Like just for example, um, uh, we are working with a Pulitzer Center on um, tracking the supply chain and its impact on deforestation. Of course, you can see a lot of links there because a lot of the supplies, for instance, come from the Amazon, Congo Basin region and Southeast Asia, and these are consumed you know, elsewhere. So information can be made available not just you know within our own countries so in this sense global investigations can put the spotlight on illegal or illicit activities done at the very local level and you know when done right these can compel key actors to act or put pressure on those who must be held accountable um, I mean, in our experience, you know, you know, from the examples done by ICIJ, OCCRP, 
powerful criminals and people in authority may feel very comfortable, you know, in their own countries, but not so much when they know that the world is watching. Thank you. Right. Right. Thank you, Carol. Maybe let me have follow up with another question. In, in, a, in a conversation we had just right before the beginning of this uh, panel, you highlighted how, um, you know, in order to be able to carry out cross-border journalistic project, uh, journalists and newsroom need to have reached a certain level of skills, a certain level of, um, you know, also stability, financial stability and all of that. So how, what, how can we as, and, and we, I'm talking about, you know, the donors community out there, but also you as journalists with your audiences and so on, what do you need in order to ensure that these type of um, cross-border collaborations are growing and in order to make also your community uh, bigger? Yeah, thanks, Barbara. Uh, I, I think we have to realize that um, doing collaborations, at least, you know, from my observation with the pandemic ongoing and we're experiencing one crisis after another, it's no longer the future, but actually a necessity now, especially again with, you know, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic happening, it, it has limited our ways to do field work, for instance. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, crimes like, for instance, illicit financial flows, online sexual exploitation of children, human trafficking, uh, these are, you know, crimes have also crossed borders. So for some of the most important stories of our time, there seems to be no other way to go but to collaborate. Because again, um, we're all connected. Um, but, and this is a big but, <laughs> a shift has to happen. Uh, and we have to consider that there are, of course, complex realities in our own countries. There are a lot of nuances, com complex realities on ground. Um, but I think it has to start with, of course, you know, um, going up to management and even media owners. So I think um, we can frame it in a way that we can make this, you know, like a good business case <laughs> for newsrooms, for news outlets to do collaborations because stories with impact come from collaborations and stories with impact inspire trust from readers. And we know how much um, trust we've lost um, on our readers in the last few years, I think, well, at least in the experience of the Philippines. So that's one. But these efforts also need to be complemented with support from the international journalism community and, of course, maybe including the donor community as well. Um, so that's why it's important that, you know, apart from understanding these stories, um, understanding the problems, um, we also understand we need to understand how these stories were done so we're able to replicate or perhaps you know see how we can apply the lessons in our own countries and my last point is uh, to your question on perhaps how you know the international com community can help um, i mean this is not new uh, and but this is more looking in the big picture and in the long term collaborations can only be as strong as its individual newsrooms how independent and sustainable they all are so media development has to continue especially you know in, in our part of the world um in, in southeast asia in liberal democracies so this may cover you know a variety of things like capacity and resource building digital media training and integration uh promoting diversity in the newsroom and also creating and nurturing an environment that celebrates also protects freedom of information, uh, freedom of expression, and essentially public interest. Thank you. Thank you. 
And, and, and it's interesting because, <clears throat> sorry, this is exactly our experience also, has been our experience with the IJ for EU fund in Europe that also the, if you want the success of this uh, fund, of this project was given by the fact that not, not only funds were made available to journalism, but also there was training behind, there was um, editorial support, as well as, you know, intervention from uh, organizations like IPI and many of our partners on press freedom issues whenever um, relevant. So let me turn to Carlos because I, Connect Us, I think is offering precisely all this, is basically offering all the infrastructure that is needed for the type of cross-border collaboration that you're trying to, that you're looking at uh, promoting. I was wondering, do you see an opportunity for closer cooperation between uh, news organizations, journalists, and civil society, on the other hand. And, uh, and, and, and how can this cooperation between these two groups promote cross-border um, journalism? Yes, that's, that's a very interesting experience. Usually, the relationship between the media and civil organizations has challenged no? organizations distrust the ability of journalism sometimes and they only want to install their pre-release for the part for the media for the journalists we only want to approach the organizations as, as a sources no? the paradox is that we are rowing for the same side and the question is how to establish better relationships to build something together that is why we have been building those bridge for some years. Um, for example, uh, in this morning, in this moment in, in Dominican Republic, we are working with Participación Ciudadana and other civil societies organization on stories that help control resources for the pandemic. Uh, another example with Transparencia Venezuela, uh, we elaborate a work in which they contributed a powerful database that was built by lawyers who for a long time and in different countries review hundreds or perhaps thousands of files, no? something that the journalism never can do. No? We don't have the knowledge, we don't have the expertise. And, and our journalistic work uh, involved a dozen of members of Connectors that together with the leadership of Solari and David Gonzalez that was our editors, allowed to identify the issues that were developed from journalists. The result is the investigation called Chavismo Inc. that I, I, I'm going to share the link to. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and this is, this is a wonderful job and I, I agree. I think it's a wonderful experience uh, because at the end, the investigative techniques for the organizations were added with those of the journalist production. And the result that helped to expose the fate of more than, in this case, more than $5 billion of Venezuelans around the world. What is the key? The key is to raise even more the level of demands, especially to clarity in each step. Because there are things that it in, and relations with, in, in, in between journalists, one takes for, for granted. But with organizations, we must not forget that also we row for the same side, uh, the purpose are different. No? As a journalist, we want to share good information. They, were, they want to do advocacy or they have other interests, but it is possible and, and the results are, are, are very interesting. I, I yeah, yes, I, I share the link now. Great, thank you very much. And I see that Lucy is congratulating you for the Petro Fraude project that uh, you have carried out, Carlos. <laughs> uh, Catherine, um, what about Kenya and the region you are um, active in? Is, is there um, cooperation with civil society, other civil society organizations, or even academic institutions? Uh, um, as part of your work, and, and is this beneficial to uh, journalism? Uh, yeah, it's quite, uh, I mean, it's a no-brainer again, just like Carlos said, uh, 
uh, civil society organizations tend to have a lot of information which is not readily accessible to journalists. They actually may have data which you cannot get, but which they've been able to get or they've been able to collect. So at the end of the day, it doesn't I mean, we you need to work with civil society and we've been working with civil society organizations for example, those ones that are working within the human trafficking space and those ones who are dealing with SGBV and GBV and also health, and access to reproductive health services, for example, in, in Uganda. And the reason for this is because they do have the expertise. We may not. They have the data or the information you don't have. And the other thing is also when it comes to making trips or going out into the field, their one shilling, your one shilling is two shillings. What they want to go on the ground as a civil society organization is limited by their own resources because they also don't have an end in resources in terms of finances. Your newsroom also is constrained because of money. So when you work together, when you collaborate or when you work with civil society, you can actually go further. The only caveat, obviously, is that you as a journalist maintain your editorial independence. It doesn't mean that you will be singing their song or doing their advocacy for them. Because like Carlos said very clearly, we are all on the same side. We're all working together for good, for the good of the communities we are serving. Whether I'm coming at it from the point of view of, uh, an ad, uh, of a civil society, Journalists, we are here to try and fight for the betterment of our people or our communities, for good things to happen, to expose the bad things that are happening, to hold those who are doing them to account. And it's the same thing. Although civil society comes at that same struggle from a different side, but we're all working the same road. So it really is a no-brainer working with civil society and even academia because uh, for example, some of the research we've been, especially around the COVID pandemic, there's been a lot of research done, but not in our space about ourselves. So really looking and identifying the scientists who are working on this problem from our context, being able to interact with them, for example, getting experts from the Africa CDC to tell us about the COVID pandemic, because everybody is talking about the pandemic from this global scenario, but I need to get to understand so that I can inform my audience that what is happening has a relation to what is going on here. So that when everybody is saying, oh, we've got this vaccine, not the other vaccine, how are you going to deal with that? So you need to work with academia as well as civil society. And for me, it's, it's a relationship that bodes the best, I mean, I think it's the best thing that can happen, especially when it comes to collaborative, um, whether it's investigations or just normal storytelling. Working with civil society opens doors that might otherwise have been closed for you as a journalist. And they also have access to information we really need and we may not be able to get. Why struggle too hard when you can get somebody who can help you work or lift that load? So that's the way I look at uh, the the relationship, and that's how we've been working with CSOs and uh, academia. And that and that's a great um, approach, Catherine. I see there is already a question in the in the chat, and I'll get to it in a moment. Maybe before we go to that, I wanted to uh, reflect a little bit on what you all have just mentioned with regard to cooperation, collaboration, and all of that. I mean, we we also know uh, there is also a lot of competition in the journalism. Uh, field media outlets are business and are we have competitors as well as between journalists. Is this is this an issue and is this maybe less of an issue in the moment we work cross borders because our competitors tend to be within the national borders? How do you see or, or is the or is the approach to journalism just changing? And you know we're because it has been become so difficult to do journalism, we have understood that we have to collaborate more. And so we have to give up on, uh, on uh, you know, we have to, to, to forget about competition because something else, there is a common goal there. And I just, just wanted to understand how you see uh, this issue. Maybe starting with you, Carol. Hi, yeah. Um... 
that is one of the complex realities also that we have to face in our own countries. And I see, and I think, you know, uh, my colleagues in the Philippines would agree, if you're talking of corporations, definitely competition is very high. Um, but as you said, this is less of a problem if you're working with another news organization uh, in another country because, you know, you aren't um, direct uh, competitors. But the way I'm looking at it, uh, as I mentioned um, earlier, I think for us to, you know, go over this hump or, you know, this uh, uh, stumbling block, if you will, is uh, make it a, a good business case. So if we're talking of media uh, corporations, because like, for example, in the Philippines, PCIJ, we do collaborations with um media corporations because you know they don't see us as uh, a direct um, competitor because we are an investigative nonprofit um but again if we're looking at you know make this you know bigger if let's say the major news outlets work with community newspapers and again you know i think that would you know really be able to do powerful collaborations and stories again as i mentioned earlier it they it can be made as you know as a good business case because again you will be able to produce stories that you know make impact and it also lessens the uh, you know like in the Philippines uh, it's very politicized like one media organization is branded as anti-government but if you work together then you know readers viewers will understand that you know they're not doing this for you know a particular purpose of taking down government but because this is recognized uh, this story is being covered because it is an important story thank you right so thanks uh, and sorry well while, while i'm i have you on the microphone um carol do you work with uh, freelance journalists normally or also because you mentioned newsrooms as well uh, yes, uh, thank you, Liana, for the question. Yes, we do work with um, freelance journalists, and this is actually uh, very advantageous for us because as an investigative nonprofit, as you all know, we are a small organization. So we actually, we have few reporters um, in-house, but we do have a pool of reporting fellows, and these are all freelance reporters. So. In a way, it works both ways because, um, you know, again, um, because we're a small organization, we can't hire a lot of full-time reporters. So that's why we tap freelance reporters. And it, it's also an advantage because these freelance reporters have a lot of expertise in, you know, whichever beat or topic or issue that they've been covering for many years. So if anything, we find them as kind of like our expert journalists if let's say you know um covering the criminal justice system uh covering um health issues or education issues so yes we do thank you liana <laughs> thank you and thank you carol what about you carlos first of all uh, do you guys work uh with freelancers and and secondly is is competition either between newsrooms or between individual journalists an issue for you is it a, is it a hurdle an obstacle Oh, your, your your mic is muted. That, that is a, a very good question, no? because the, the base for the collaborative work is the, the, the trust. And you need to know the people. And for that reason, in Connectus, we, we invest a lot of time, you know, to build an, a, a strong community, people that we teach for a long time, with they, that we are sure that they understand the methodologies and the techniques that we use, and and then they start to work with us, and they they start under Connectus umbrella work together. That's that is the the technique, no? And actually, we we work with a lot of journalists. Some of them in uh, they are staff media. Some of them are freelance. And for that reason, we have an, an strategy called Connectus Hub. But right now. Uh, uh, this year, we are going to start something that we call ARCO, A-R-C-O, which means Connectus connect Regional Actions. And we are looking for a closer job with the, the media. Uh, when then their first emphasis is to show 
then what they earn no? well focused in collaboration produce very good results that increase prestige for the media and increase readerships and man and, and for manage for, for the people that has a skill in the management they can be translated into their forms or, or financing no uh, of uh, it is interesting because collaboration sometimes is easier in cross-border landscape sometimes are more difficult inside the same country no mm -hmm. uh, that uh, is, is very interesting uh, experience for that reason uh, we are working to to change that old metaphor that talk about the lone wolf no that the era mm -hmm. is over i would like to complement it i would like to say that the age of the walls is over mm -hmm. well the walls when the walls are not alone they act to our impact and we prefer the metaphor for the ants, no? Where each one contributes a piece to allow a better understanding of the reality. We we are concerned how the new ecosystem in the in the in the media in the journalists looks like a pack of wolves, no? Not mm -hmm. long a pack of wolves, and and we care about that. We prefer the ants. And we look at ants, a hundred of ants in Latin America, and we are open to work together with everybody. <laughs> I, I like I like your quote that the age of the lone wolves is over. Um, I don't I don't know how journalists see that to be treated as ants rather than wolves somehow, but <laughs> no, but I think what I think is clear what you mean and and um and um and I agree that that the, the we also see a difference in the approach to journalism within our network. It's really, uh, I think that many, many journalists across the world has understood that either we work together or we are going to succumb together. So no. it's, a, it's a big a topic. Catherine, great to see you're back. <laughs> um, yeah, wh what about, uh, what about, um, what about your region? First of all, exactly, do you work primarily with freelance journalists? Uh, your, is your network made of freelance journalists or of journalists who are uh, operating on staff as part of newsrooms? Uh, and, um, and, and secondly, um, is, is competition an issue that you, that you face? I'm sorry about that. We had the power out. It <laughs> keeps on coming and going. Not to worry. Anyway, um, yeah, we we work with a few freelancers, but a lot of the journalists we work with are, have, I mean, come from different newsrooms in the different countries where we are at, but they all don't come from the same newsroom. And one of the things we found is there is obviously competition, and that is a huge thing. Every journalist wants to break the big story on their own, and the newsroom wants to be the one that does that. But the way we've worked it is such that, for example, if it's an issue that has to do with one country, we work with one of the fellows in that country, not the three fellows looking at that issue from the same country. So we work, for example, a Kenyan, a Ugandan, and a Nigerian, and a Ghanaian uh, would work on one story, but they would publish uh, on their different news, uh, news outlets. We have freelancers also, but because we we help, what we do is we help them pitch the story to the different publications in their own country so that at least they can get published so that it's not like it's not going to get published. So if you, if one of the fellows, some of the fellows are freelancers, once they do a story or once they work on a story, we pitch it to a local out news outlet so that then they can publish that. Because we also want to make sure that these uh, um, freelancers have an opportunity to put their work out there. And then in other situations like in Tanzania where COVID was, I know it wasn't happening, depending on which day of the week. But anyway, it, it, we found a way around that by getting the, the, the reporters in Tanzania to write stories about COVID, but we wouldn't publish in their news outlet because obviously it would be problematic for them would publish it in other uh, in, uh, news outlets in other countries so in a way it's trying to figure out what makes sense how and what but we do definitely have uh, freelancers but the idea is to 
give this women journalists an opportunity to put their work forward. And that's the whole reason why we, we encourage freelancers to work with us because from there they can go and do other things, but they also develop the expertise that comes from working on specific stories which they're interested in and then being able to share that outside. So a few of them have actually got opportunities to get jobs because you know jobs are not happening. They have cutting down jobs. So if you can get your way into the newsroom at this particular time because of your expertise or because of the content that you're able to produce, that's a plus. And mm -hmm. I think that's the way to look at it. You know, I mean, another way of looking at it. Uh, Great, so, I think, uh, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, I think I mentioned about the competition. Yeah. I think there will, there will be instances where it's better to work I call it working downwards. You work with a local, uh, maybe community media outlet. You will be able to get the local and get the local person to actually learn something. You can teach each other something from the local. The looking parallel and major news outlet and another major news outlet. That one is not going to happen unless there is really like Carol says the business sense for it. What are the dollars? The dollar signs at the bottom of it, what value? And that's why sometimes it's easier to do, I call it working downwards or mm -hmm. down up. So you work with community to mainstream and or mainstream with community or parallel, outside, mm -hmm. outside. Yeah. So that's the way I looked at it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I think these are really great um, lessons learned, like example on how to go around some of the obstacles. And I think that what all of you have highlighted is that there is a value not only in the journalistic cooperation, the cross-border cooperation, but also having organizations like uh, the Africa Women Journalism Project or Connect Us or the Philippine Center um, for Investigative Journalism coordinating this, making sure that you know where where and help journalists identify where can they find the skills that they need? Where can they find a news outlet that can publish when they cannot publish in their own country and all of that? So I think th this really highlights the need for the type of infrastructures that your organizations are offering. Now, we just have three minutes to go and we still have to take a photo, I'm being told by the organizers. Um, and But maybe if you can, each of you in one minute highlight, if you had one wish, one thing that would really help you in the work that you're trying to do, what would that be? Uh, starting with you, Catherine. <laughs> okay, um, I would say actually getting, I don't know whether you want to call it the capacity building and also being able to come up with a business model that makes us sustainable. Because at the end of the day, at some point, somebody will switch off the, I don't call it a top, but we need to be able to show, present a business case for what we're doing. Collaborative journalism needs to be able to support itself. And being, if we can find a way of whether it's a hybrid kind of funding model where we're making money, but you're also getting additional support from, uh, from donors or something. So that for me would be that. Thank you. What about you, Carol? Um, I guess for me, similar to what Catherine said and what I mentioned earlier about um, how uh, media development, this has to be, you know, complemented by, you know, help from the international journalism community and perhaps, you know, the donor community as well. If anything, perhaps um, the kind of, you know, foundation or anchor, you know, what to do next is... Uh, there's this popular quote by Toni Morrison that, you know, which I think is the center of you know, in journalism, that if you have some freedom, you know, you free somebody else. And if you have some power, you have to, you know, empower somebody else. So in that sense, I think, I think that's kind of, you know, the spirit of collaboration also is, you know, helping each other. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, Carlos, what, what would be the one the one wish you would like to see coming through to, to help you in your professional efforts? Yes, I believe that, <clears throat> sorry, the key factor is what helps us to build better networks. What do we need? For example, information is key, 
but this data without the ability to analyze and process is not the same. And without resources to do, it's also something essential. Uh, there is talk of technology resources, but perhaps the most expensive is the resource that pays the time of those who participate in these efforts. No? Sometimes, you know, programs, etc., put a lot of attention in, in, in put resources in databases, in access for uh, technology, but the time for the people, uh, good people, good talents cost money. And, and, and you need to, to tame enough resource, you know, to maintain the, the human talent. The organizations are nothing without human, and, yeah. and that's the key. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you so much for this. And um, yeah, unfortunately, we are coming to an end, uh, but I would like to thank you all. This has been, uh, I, I thought it was really interesting and really inspiring. Congratulations for the work that you are, are, are doing. Um, it's so important and, and thank you for the lessons learned. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've learned a lot indeed. Um, we need to still take a screenshot, I understand. So maybe three, two, one now. I think that's it. And uh, I'm heading it back to the host. Thank you so much for the organizers. And thank you so much, Carlos, Carol, and Catherine. Good luck. Thank you, Barbara. Thank, thank you, everyone. Barbara. Take care. Bye, Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Barbara, indeed. Uh, I can only echo what you said, a very informative, highly educational session on the challenges journalists in Africa, South America, and Southeast America are facing when it comes to cross-border journalism. A very valuable panel indeed. Thanks so much, Barbara, for chairing it in such a uh, wonderful way. Uh, two down, two more to go. Uh, once again, we'll break uh, for approximately 15 minutes. Don't go too far because we'll be back with the third panel of day two. Uh, it'll deal with innovation in cross-border journalism. The panel will address cutting edge investigative techniques that promise to keep cross-border journalists ahead of the curve that'll take place less than 50 minutes from now right here so please don't go anywhere looking forward to welcoming you back here shortly for panel three of day two